Thank you very much for joining us, Dave. My pleasure. We've just watched you come off of stage from a, a fantastic presentation, Thank you. Uh, which uh, I've already got quite a few comments on our, on our way leaving. We've seen uh, shuttles, we've seen dead rabbits and all kinds of other things. Explain how that all ties into markets. Well, I was talking about a process which uh, is called normalization of deviance, and this comes from studies of the engineering of risky technology. And uh, so people have studied engineering and risks and accidents in nuclear power, in space systems, space flight systems, in uh, defense and aerospace systems, in civil engineering, a whole bunch of different fields. And what they found is that there's a fairly common process where things that aren't supposed to happen do happen. And when they don't cause a disaster, people think that is evidence that no disaster can ever be caused by that kind of event. So deviant events, things which are deviant because they're not supposed to happen, become normalized. And the reason why I'm talking about that here at HFT Trade Tech is that uh, I think that since the flash crash uh, of May the 6th, 2010, in the last couple of years, there have been a number of events, probably the most recent one being the collapse in the BATS share issue, the IPO, which counters deviant events. And so the concern is that we're getting used to these deviant events. These mini flash crashes are occurring, they're becoming normal, and we may be storing up major trouble for later unless we uh, acknowledge what's going on. Um, and what do you think people should, should then be looking at to try and mitigate that, to try and avoid it altogether? Uh, well, again, I think uh, one can look to the um, other engineering fields which deal with risky technology. So here risky is used in a, in a kind of a technical sense. So a technology is risky if you're pushing the boundaries of what you can do with that technology and so you don't fully understand the capabilities of the systems you're building. And uh, there's no shame to building risky systems, but I do think a lot of advanced automated trading systems count as risky under that definition. Or perhaps m more grandly, the global financial markets are now a risky system because for the first time ever, we've got every market, computers in every market can talk to other computers in any other market. So really the whole world is just one system wrapped by this global network of interacting autonomous automated trading systems and furthermore with the rise of HFT we've become used to systems which are capable of operating at truly superhuman speeds by which I just mean faster than me right okay so my reaction time from watching a number change on a screen to punching buy or sell on a keyboard is probably a second or two most, most HFT systems can do an awful lot in that one or two seconds when I'm just attempting to execute one trade so we have systems which are interacting with other systems that they never knew they were going to interact with. Uh, they weren't all engineered to common standards. Uh, they're all over the planet. They can all interact with each other and they can move very, very quickly. And I just think that um, yeah, looking at what's been done in other engineering fields may be valuable. And I guess at the close of the presentation I gave today, I spoke about the, the use of simulation methods. So trying to understand the capabilities of your system or the behavior of a system by building some kind of abstract simulation model of it and then using that simulator to understand when the system is in its safe zone and isn't going to cause you any nasty surprises, and when it might be in a dangerous zone where with just a small perturbation, just a small problem or change in circumstances, it could suddenly go into a, a catastrophic collapse. So you talk all the way about, about simulation, about the human element uh, uh, being more and more of a, a factor to consider that isn't being considered enough. Does this mean we're now getting to a point now that we're talking of global markets and automated systems that actually we may have to forego the human altogether? Yeah, well, I think uh, there's already data in the public domain which shows that the number of transactions in major financial markets, either in Europe or in the US or in the Far East, where both, both parties, the, the, both the initiator of the trade and the counterparty to that trade are machine systems rather than humans, uh, that's become commonplace. So roughly 50% of transactions in a lot of markets today involve um, robots or algorithmic systems on both sides. Roughly 45% are an algorithmic system on one side and a human on the other side. And the shocking or surprising, uh, the big change at least, is in the last five or six or maybe seven years, the number of transactions in the major markets which involve a human on both sides of the trade has gone from roughly 50% to maybe less than 10%. Uh, and that's, that's, that, yeah, that's just commonplace. So, so there are many markets in which uh, m sequences of transactions occur where really there's no human involved at the point of execution. Of course, at some point, 
further, you know, further down the line, earlier on, someone programmed these systems to do what they do. So the humans are involved in that sense. But at the point of execution, there's a very high degree of automation. Yeah. So now that we're seeing fully automated transactions on a, a fairly day-to-day -day basis, and we're now seeing that the, the really it's just the programmer and the strategist, are we now seeing the death of the trader? Yeah, well, I think in, in some instrument classes, in some types of asset, uh, at the point of execution, you no longer have trading floors at the exchanges with people shouting at each other and gesturing and, and writing orders on tickets. Instead, it really is machine to machine. Now, of course, those machines have been programmed by someone at some point. So, they're, yeah, there are still humans involved in the system. But then, as you say, they're technical programmers or analysts or quants rather than traders. That isn't the case for all asset classes at the moment. So there are, it's been very successful, the rise of algorithmic trading and high frequency trading, first really in equities and then latterly in FX and, uh, and fixed income markets, means that there are other, you know, especially the derivative markets at the moment, so OTC swaps. It's probably going to go that way, but it isn't there yet. Do, we, do you think that maybe if we take it a step back even further, that it's possible that through behavioural modelling and other such uh, um, ways of using computers to build your algorithms, eventually we won't even need people to come up with those algorithms. That is a very interesting proposition. Uh, so in principle, yes, but, um, but there are reasons why people like to have people involved. Okay, so if you think about uh, commercial air flight, um, most, most, most transatlantic jets can pretty much fly themselves. I mean, if you, if you tow them to the start of the runway, they can take off, they can navigate and they can land. But still, when I get on a plane, I like to see a human pilot at the front uh, because I trust that person to be accountable in times of crisis uh, and it just gives me a good feeling. So I think, I think in, pos in principle it is possible to have fully automated human, human free markets, but I think the customers will always want there to be humans um, partially for reassurance and also for responsibility for those one in a million events that the program, the programmers just haven't anticipated. So the great thing about a human trader or a human um, supervisor of a trading system is they have a sense of common sense. They'll know that these numbers are mad or that should never happen and might uh, act uh, appropriately. Whereas giving that kind of common sense to uh, an algorithmic trading system can be quite difficult. So for instance in uh, extremely adverse market events like the flash crash, the robots were all happily trading because they, they were just taking the numbers and not, not questioning whether those numbers made sense. You know, does it make sense that this equity that used to be $40 is now one cent or is now $100,000? I don't care. I'm a robot. Uh, whereas humans do care. So yeah, I think, I, think, I think the number of humans that are involved at the point of execution has been falling dramatically over the last five to ten years, will continue to fall very dramatically but I think it will be a long time before markets are ever 100% human free. And for that reason, it means the markets will remain not just technical systems, but socio-technical systems. It's about social entities, people and groups of people and firms interacting with the technology. The thing I think that the big change that has occurred in the last few years has been the rise of high frequency trading, where things can happen at timescales that no human can react at. And that should give us pause for thought. We just need to make sure we have appropriate controls and regulations in place. Right, well, thank you very much for taking the time. Genuinely fascinating. I would love to be able to con continue the discussion for, for, for hours, but uh, if people do want to con continue, maybe read some more and find out more about what you've been doing, I know the last of you here actually running some experiments. Where can they find out uh, about Well, this um, yeah, so uh, I run a big organisation that's a national research initiative called the Large Scale Complex IT Systems Initiative, LSCITS, or LSITS. And if you go to www.lsits.org, uh, then you can find all of our publications, which includes the papers that talk about the experiments we've done at Trade Tech 2011 and at Trade Tech 2010, yeah, where we studied under experimental conditions human traders interacting with algorithmic trading systems, just to get a better understanding of the dynamics of today's markets. Because there's the real markets out there where real human traders are interacting with real algorithmic trading systems. And um, what we as experimenters want to understand is what the nature of those markets might be before they go wrong. So we do that under laboratory conditions in our experimental studies. And yeah, thank you for mentioning that, but they're available from www.lseits.org. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks, Dan.